Uh, most of you know Rachel Wentz. Uh, she had a 13-year career as a firefighter paramedic in Orlando. Uh, during that time period, she also earned a master's in public administration, but she left that career uh, to go up to FSU where she earned her PhD in anthropology. And uh, interesting for people in this area, she did a lot of her grad, well, almost all of her graduate work and postgraduate work working on the, the skeletons from Windover, from the Windover dig up uh, in the Titusville area. And so she's an expert on Windover. She is a bioarchaeologist. She's gone all over the world, though, doing uh, different excavations, the, the, the Ukraine. Uh, she's been in uh, Great Britain, uh, working in the museum there, uh, done all sorts of exciting things. Uh, for about seven years, I guess, she was uh, director of the Florida Public Archaeology Network East Central Region. Uh, and uh, uh, it was first at Brevard Community College, now, of course, East Florida uh, State College. Uh, and uh, it was here, too. But uh, recently, of course, they have uh, rest FPAN restructured, which is why we created the Florida Historical Society Archaeological Institute. And Rachel Wentz is the first director of FHSAI. And uh, the Searching Sand and Surf, the Origins of Archaeology in Florida, is the premier uh, publication. One of the things FHSAI is going to be doing is publishing books on archaeology, and this, this volume, edited by Rachel, is the first in that series. Florida Historical Society Press has also published her books, Chasing Bones and Archaeologists' Pursuit of Skeletons, and Windover, uh, Life and Death at Windover, uh, Excavations of a 7,000-Year-Old Pond Cemetery. So this is the third book uh, that Florida Historical Society Press has published of Rachel's, the first and premier book of the Florida Historical Society Archaeological Institute. So we're very pleased that Rachel is uh, uh, director of FHSAI. And uh, without further ado, uh, uh, here is Rachel Wenz to discuss her new work. All right. Thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. I'm going to turn this just a little. There we go. So we pick it up. Um, before I get started, of course, this book, like any book, is really a, a joint effort between a lot of people. And so I wanted to thank a few people. First of all, Ben Broatmarkle, because he actually conceived of this idea of looking back through the archives of the Florida Historical Quarterly and pulling out articles that focused on archaeology. So he not only conceived the idea, but he also provided kind of a guiding hand throughout the process. Um, Chris Broatmarkle, his wife, designed the beautiful cover. So when you take a look at it, um, it turned out wonderfully. And our IT man behind the camera back there, Paul Pruitt, um, brought it to life and, and made it what it is. So those two work wonderfully together in designing many of our beautiful publications and our books. Um, of course, even though these were articles taken from the quarterly, they needed a lot of editing. And we're so fortunate to have Kirsten Russell, who's standing back there in the back wave, Kirsten. Uh, Kirsten has worked on almost every single one of my books, even books that were not published here at FHS. She's been an incredible inspiration for me, has taught me a tremendous amount, and worked very hard on getting this book into uh, kind of the order it needed to be, as did Chris Galloway, another one of our wonderfully gifted volunteers that work here. So I want to thank all of them, and especially Ben Broatmarkle, because as he said, this is my third book with FHS Press, so he's done a lot to nurture me along as a writer and so it means the world to me. So, Searching Sand and Surf, when Ben and I first sat down and started talking about this, um, I really wasn't sure what to expect. I'd never edited a book before. Um, I thought it would be a really interesting challenge to take on, especially after having written books. I thought, well, this has got to be easier. Um, it was in some ways. In some ways, it wasn't at all, especially because we had to, you know, I, once I had culled the articles, then we had to take all these PDFs, convert them into text, convert them into Word, clean them up, and get them into a format that we could flow them. And so Chris had a lot to do with that. She kind of devised the way we were going to approach that. But it all came together beautifully. And what I realized when I first got started 
um, going back through this incredible journal that dates back to 1908, when it first started being published by the Florida Historical Society, was that I looked at the very first publication and struck gold right away, because right off the bat, one of the first articles was the origin of shell mount. This might be kind of interesting. Well, throughout all of the articles I pulled for this book, they were fascinating. I learned such a tremendous amount because it's not like reading about the evolution of archeology. span What you're actually doing is witnessing this evolution. And I'm gonna take you through tonight on a brief presentation of not only what I learned from the book, but it's kind of the backdrop for the evolution of this discipline in Florida and how it started out with some of just the earliest musings. If we look at this, part of uh, Detweiler's article, he claims an intelligent person said to the writer, what an upheaval of nature's forces must have occurred to produce this vast pile of shelves, little realizing they were the kitchen bins or the refuse of the culinary department of forgotten races <laughs> of men. So you can see even from the beginning, this speculation about who were the people that were early here in Florida. And it just kind of got better as it went along. So I started looking into it and, you know, looking at the origins of archaeology. And in America, one of the founding fathers of archaeology was actually one of our earliest presidents, Thomas Jefferson. Because Thomas Jefferson, as we all know, was a, an incredible intellect, a very curious uh, scientist and cultural person. And he had mounds near his property, right along the Ravana River. So he started excavating them. He was the first to really document mounds, and he kind of took his lead from the Danish because the Danish had already started excavating what they called these kitchen middens, these refuse heaps over in the Netherlands where they found that they could learn a lot about the people who once lived here. Well, Jefferson kind of took their lead. He excavated some of these mounds. He even found human remains and went to the great effort of trying to decide how many people were actually buried in that, which is really cutting edge because before no one would have thought to count the individuals, determine maybe when these people were buried. He also contributed the principle of stratigra stratigraphy, which is one of the founding principles of archeology, span meaning that things that are deeper than other things typically are older than those things above them. So Jefferson did this. He wrote up all of his excavation results in his notes on the state of Virginia. And he even said, musing about these different mound sites, their repositories of the dead has been obvious to all, but on what particular occasion constructed was matter of doubt. So he's talking to this curiosity that was kind of burgeoning around the Americas as to who the earliest people were. Now, American archaeology went through several phases in its development, and it kind of took its lead from things that were happening around the world, because, you know, America is still a relatively new country. Um, Paul, what's going on? Since we're using the name Mike, there's no reason to be right. on anymore. Thank you. Okay, so things were going on around the world. People had been doing archaeology for around uh, for a while at other um, other areas around the world. We have this old picture of excavations at Pompeii dating to the 1800s. So American archaeology kind of followed suit as to what was going on in Europe and other areas around the world. And this earliest phase of American archaeology was really pure speculation. People kind of looked at these sites and these relics of ancient cultures and just kind of made up stories about who these people could have been. And what we'll see as we go through Searching Sand and Surf is a perfect template of how these things uh, were reflected in archaeological research. Um, once that speculation gave way to actual investigation, we see people wanting to classify. And that classificatory nature in all of us went through several phases itself. First of all, all they did was describe. When they would dig, they'd find things, and they'd describe the objects they found. And skeletal analysis went through the same thing. The earliest years of human skeletal analysis or bioarchaeology, basically when they find skeletons, they just describe them. They wouldn't really do any in-depth analysis. 
But that descriptive trend slowly gave way to people wanting to find out, well, what came first? What were the order of events that brought these remains together, that you know, brought the remnants of these ancient cultures? And so the chronology started coming together. You know, who was here and when did they give way to other people? What were the sequence of human occupations? And finally, chronology gave way to context and function. We wanted to know how did ancient cultures function, how did their societies function, and how do we read that in the archaeological record? And of course, all of this has developed into our modern era, which is kind of a processual approach, looking at all of these things in nature. But what we're going to see is this reflected in the articles that were, are contained within Searching Sand and Surf. In some of the, in part one of Searching Sand and Surf, which we called Early Archaeology in Florida, we see this because in 1908, De Detweiler wrote Antiquities at Near New Smyrna, where he kind of just mused about who left these things behind. You know, who were these first people whose remnants were finding on the landscape? In Indian Races of Florida, Harrison kind of did the similar thing. He just kind of went through and gave lists of names of different Indian places. And Frank Drew kind of picked that up by bringing together a compilation of all the different Indian names from around the state, like Miami, Okeechobee, all these different names of places and rivers and lakes that we know today were taken from Native American terms. And so he compiled this all together just to kind of speculate about how they originated. And so let's talk about historic period. Because these earliest articles in archaeology, and these earliest investigations, of course, come against the backdrop of territorial Florida. How uh, Florida was developing as a state in the 1800s, because it was very different than it is today. First of all, it was experiencing an incredible population boom. You can look at the numbers and between 1980, 40, and just 40 years later, the population is doubling, tripling in some cases, and that's because of the industry. Cattle, citrus, sugar, all of these main industries that fed off the bounty of Florida as a temperate climate, people were massing down here to get to take part in the industry, buying up land. And of course, when they're buying up land, they're looking at the land. And recreation, and recreation is the perfect segue into our archeological explorations because people came down to hunt and fish. You know, the, Florida was full of bounty. Uh, they were exporting what they were hunting. People were coming down here and trapping and selling off deer and bear hide, killing off panthers. And of course, working off the coast as well. Sponging became a big industry. They were diving wrecks off the coast. But all of this um, had to do not only with recreation, but they found another form of recreation. And it had everything to do with our archaeological sites because the native shell mounds that were found on the landscape were considered part of that interesting physical aspect of what Florida was. All of these shell mounds that dotted the landscape were just part of the physical environment to many people, especially those visitors that came down. And so while they weren't off shooting and killing panthers, what they were doing were digging in mounds. Uh, they would gather together in their finest clothes in some cases. These were great photo opportunities. These were great spots to have picnics because typically a shell mound doesn't have a lot of dirt on it if it's covered with shell. These are elevated platforms so people could get together, get a bit of a breeze, have their lunch, relax on the shell mounds, and of course, take photographs. The photographs start showing up in some of our tourist industry. In fact, they're even used to lure tourism here to Florida. This is a postcard that says Turtle Mound at New Smyrna containing interesting Indian relics, almost inviting people to come down and dig through one of these mounds to see what you can find. So these archeological sites are kind of becoming part of this physical bounty that are drawing people to Florida. Wrecking was also becoming a hobby because as scuba gear came into you know, fashion and was sold to the public, all of a sudden people could go right offshore and start diving all of these massive wrecks that dotted the coast. And what we have when we combine people going out and diving the wrecks and people digging through and pilfering these mounds are basically site destruction and loss of information. So when we start looking at those earliest origins of archaeology, 
we've, we look and see that it came just in time because just as we're losing all of these incredible cultural resources, luckily people started wanting to know more about them. And so what we see um, is not only site destruction from sporting and fishing, but one of the biggest uh, loss of archeological sites when we're talking about shell mounds was through the pilfering of shell for paving roads because this was a huge industry in the 1800s in Florida. In fact, it, like other aspects of digging in mounds, started finding its way into the literature, and they really didn't understand where these mounds came from. As you can see, this one's called Old Spanish Shell Mound. And of course, the Spanish had nothing to do with this shell mound. They predate the Spanish by sometimes thousands of years. But even these started looking up, they started even calling them shell pits instead of shell mounds because they were literally mining them. In fact, what I learned from my friend John Steiner, who works at Canaveral National Seashore, 70% of the shell mounds of Volusia County that once stood are now gone, mainly because of this pilfering of shell. In fact, they even started to brag about it on our postcards. It says, New Smyrna, Florida, Old Spanish Shell Mound attributed to the appetites of the Aborigines and the early Spanish Spanish adventures. This is one of the immense piles of shells 20 feet high which are now mined to form the beautiful shell roads so prevalent throughout Florida. So again, these things weren't considered vital to our knowledge of the past. They were just part of the Florida landscape. So let's talk about the first excavations because these first excavations also kind of play into this whole exploring Florida mentality because they weren't really excavations at all. They were more a form of antiquarianism, you know, kind of this curiosity, you think in terms of some of the mummy uh, unwrappings that went on in London. People were curious about the past, but they didn't really know how to approach it because formal training in archeology, span especially in America was un heard of at this time. Some of these early antiquariums, typically they were educated people like physicians. John Durkee was one of the first. He excavated, dug into a mound on the St. John's. Samuel Forey was also an early physician that came down. They would come down in winter in Florida and for something to do, they'd go out, they'd find these mounds and they'd start digging. The problem is even though these were curious, intelligent individuals, they really had no way to document and to pass on this information. So they didn't really contribute much to what we were learning about Florida's past. One of the first excavations that came down and was the uh, Pepperhurst expedition to Key Marco in 1896. It was led by Frank Cushing, who was uh, worked for the Smithsonian, was not an archeologist, he was an ethnologist, but he was a very educated individual. They started digging and what they encountered were incredible artifacts recovered from this site because the site had become inundated with water, so it was a wet site, and it produced some beautifully well-preserved wooden artifacts from the Calusa culture. And so this was one of the first kind of documented sites that showed the incredible style of artifacts that were found among prehistoric peoples, and it kind of just fueled this, this eagerness to learn more about these cultures. So really the Pepperers expedition kind of got things going. Another individual that contributed a lot to these early explorations wasn't an archeologist either, but he, again, C.B. Moore was an educated fellow. He came from a very good fa family up in Philadelphia, and he started wintering down in Florida, and just like those before him, he was really curious about these strange mounds on the landscape. So he had the means and the money to put into uh, exploring these mounds, um, he had a little small fleet of these steamboats, which he would use. The most notorious one is the Gopher, which he used a lot. And the way he would use these little steamships was to access mounds that couldn't be accessed by road. Because remember, back then, there weren't a lot of roads, especially into some of these more you know, uh, distant, um, isolated areas. So the pink area I outlined that actually shows where he went throughout the state. He spent years coming down winter after winter, exploring these sites, digging through the mounds. Um, he documented a lot of his, uh, what we can call excavations. And so archeologists kind of have this bittersweet relationship with uh, C.B. Moore because 
He tended to destroy the mounds that he did excavate, but because of him, we have a lot of documentation about mounds that probably never would have existed come to this you know to this day and age so a lot of his information and even the artifacts he excavated are are housed in museums and universities and serve as a lot of uh, jumping off point for students and scholars so he did a lot of important work even though he was a little bit destructive in the process so what we see in part two of searching sand and surf and these are just a couple of the little excerpts to give you an idea of some of the articles are this new foundation that's starting to form. You know, we have these early antiquariums that have come in, and this is the jumping off point for people that are actually trained in archeology. span And we see this speculation give way to not only description, but chronology. All of a sudden, people started getting interested in putting things in order, getting a temporal framework for how long people have been in Florida. An Indian burial site at Crystal River is a perfect example because F.G. Rainey looks at this site and not only speculates on who these person were, people were or describes what he finds, he actually analyzes the materials that come out of the ground and, and can even discern different cultural contact and influence among this one site. Mark Boyd, who served as a, a president at the Florida Historical Society, um, Gave a, gives a wonderful report on the Committee on Archaeology. And this was a committee that was formed by the Florida Historical Society um, to get archaeology jump-started in Florida. They recognized the fact that people were fascinated by these sites, but they were destroying these sites and something had to be done. So the Florida Historical Society stepped in, uh, bless you, a man named uh, Bickle uh, had a big hand in, in bringing together the first paid archaeologist in the state of Florida. So Mark Boyd in his report talks about some of the needs we, we require here in Florida. Things like academic uh, institutions, training people in archaeology, books on Florida archaeology, you know, just a general consensus on bringing people together in more of a kind of a scholarly fashion to explore these issues. And then history and archaeology in Florida, John Griffin will become one of the most prolific archaeologists in Florida. He is probably considered one of the founding fathers of Florida archaeology. He became the first state archaeologist, um, thanks to Boyd and Bickel. Um, and in his early publication, he kind of sets a trend which he carried throughout his career, which is the joining of history and archaeology and how these two um, disciplines can really enhance the, each area and each aspect of their individual pursuits. And here's a picture of Griffin. He's the one holding the hat. And you'll see his name further on because, like I said, he was just uh, probably the most important part person in establishing Florida archaeology. One of the first professional, truly scientific excavations took place at a site called Whedon Island, which is a small island over on the west coast, north of Tampa. And in 1923, a man named Jesse Fuchs, who worked for the Smithsonian, trained archaeologist, was joined with a man named Sterling, and they went out to excavate this, this incredible site. In fact, you've probably heard of Whedon Island pottery. The Whedon Island site is the type site for a certain style of pottery. And the work they did was really monumental because it was it's not only the first scientific excavation of a site in Florida, but Fuchs believed uh, greatly in public archaeology, bringing this information to the public and engaging the public so that they could, you could educate the public. So we have these wonderful pictures of him bringing the public in. As you can tell, they dressed up as well. Archaeology was still considered a gentleman's uh, pursuit, so people tended to dress up for it. And he would let the public come in and watch the excavators. He would give uh, weekly public lectures for the year they excavated to teach the local public about their prehistory in the area. So Fuchs work was really important, not only in establishing excavation and archaeology, but engaging the public around him. 
Another big impetus for archaeology in Florida actually was tied to the Depression, because after the Depression, when Roosevelt instituted his New Deal projects, they realized that, hey, with archaeology, we can put a lot of people to work. And if we work in Florida, we can really work all year round because it's such a temperate climate. So we've got large masses of people working in this wonderful landscape. So they moved a lot of dirt. They worked for over seven years on nine different projects around the state. And they amassed a tremendous amount of data. Some of that data is still used today to find out and solve puzzles about different sites throughout the state. The only problem was they amassed a lot of data, but they didn't put any money aside for actually analyzing the data. And if you know anything about archaeology, the field work is a very small part of what goes into learning about the things we excavate. You know, some people say that for every hour you're in the field, it's seven hours in the lab of actually curating and analyzing analyzing, writing up reports. So the bulk of that archaeological work um, was kind of shelved after a lot of this work done, but it's still utilized today. So these were really important projects that kind of kick-started major works in archaeology. And it is about this time that that chronology starts kicking in, because people like Gordon Willey and Richard Woodbury started realizing that, um, you know, Cultural spectrums for the southeast were in development, but we still had none for Florida. So they took it upon themselves to start amassing chronologies of when people first arrived in Florida and the different cultures that came and went. And so following this war effort and these chronological um, bringing together, it really kind of was a booming time in Florida archaeology because things were really happening. In 1946, a program in archaeology was finally established within the Florida Park Service, and this would be the first paid archaeologist, John Griffin, who would take this lead. Um, like I said, the Florida Historical Society was one of the f kind of uh, main people to jumpstart this and get it established within the state. And what Griffin did when he first took the site was develop what's called the Florida Master Site File, which is booming today. They started with only 560 documented sites throughout the state, and it's been added to ever since, and we'll talk about it toward the end. In 1948, the office moved to Florida State Museum at University of Florida, where it resided for a very long time until DHR and the Division of Historic Resources took over. But this is the period where we really see the birth of modern archaeology in Florida, because things now are rolling in an academic fashion. We're starting to have paid archaeologists on site, and these men come together and start working throughout the state. People like Hale Smith, who would later establish the department at, uh, at Florida State University, Ripley Bullen, Charles Fairbanks, uh, John Goggin, who would head up a lot of underwater research, and Gordon Willey, who would publish proliferary, um, prolifically on archaeology throughout America. In 1947, um, they held their first conference in Daytona. A year later, they all got together at Rollins College. And this started bringing people together. So not only were these founding archaeologists out there working, but they were coming together. They were ex exchanging information and ideas. The Florida Anthropological uh, Society was developed in 1948, and this did the same thing. It's, it allowed people to network, brought people together, established their own, own journal. Um, uh, Griffin was the first editor of the journal, so he had a hand in, in implementing this. And so finally, archaeologists actually had an outlet, their own publication in which they could publish. And they're, they're still publishing this journal today. And Florida Anthropological Society has chapters throughout the state. And the wonderful thing about these are now they're available online through the University of Florida. So you can actually go into some of these really old journals and read about some of these early explorations throughout the state. In part three, what we see is this kind of maturity of the discipline. Um, in the piece by John Griffin and Hale Smith, they come together to look at a Tamuquin vi uh, village that's now located in Tomoka State Park. And again, they not only kind of describe it, but they start analyzing different aspects of the site, trying to uh, establish a chronology of when people were there, how those cultures changed. They can see cultural influence coming together and clashing. So we're really starting to be able to read what we're seeing in the ground. 
Uh, Goggin's piece on Fort Pupo is the same thing. It not only just looks at one period of time, but establishes a whole occupation range for this one piece of land. And then Bullen's article, Archaeology of the Tampa Bay Area, is an incredible synthesis of looking at all the research that's been done on the Tampa Bay Area up until the point of 1955. So you have all of these people drawing together, not only personally and at academic uh, gatherings, but starting to amass data and work together to bring this information onto a broader scale. The Division of Historic Resources is formed about this time in the mid-1960s, and it was established by the Department of State, and it was also in response to this need to um, establish a formal discipline and to regulate that discipline. Now that we had the archaeologists, we had to establish some sort of formal legal um, arena in which they could work. Um, it provided legislation to actually protect these sites for the first time. No longer could people just go out and start digging in these sites. And they um, were engaged in development throughout the state. When people were impacting land, they were stepping in to protect known cultural resources. They protect submerged sites and, of course, human remains, which are most important. The, a branch of the D, Division of Historic Resources is the Bureau of Archaeological Research. They publish a lot of different aspects of archaeological investigations, and they liaison not only with other state agencies, but with the public. If you have questions about archaeology, you can contact one of their archaeologists up at the state and get guidance on how to deal with issues, whether it's on your property or on other people's property. They also curate the state's Florida Master Site File. And you remember when uh, Griffin started that first master site file with 560 sites. Well, we now have amassed over 190,000 documented cultural resources throughout the state. And again, this is all from people coming together and working as a coherent whole. It also offers protection for archaeological sites. Um, on private land, they've put together an incredible manual called the Best Practices um, and what it allows is an online journal that allows people who have cultural resources on their property to know how to deal with them. If you have a mound site, how do you protect that? How, what do you, um, it's guidance for doing what's best for that cultural resource. And of course, if you decide to go out and dig, you have to have the landowner's permission. Sites on state lands are illegal to dig without a permit. Um, you have to have a state permit, especially in Florida waterways. And a lot of people don't understand the fact that any navigable waterway, that land belongs to the state. So anything within it also belongs to the state. And of course, on federal lands, you also need to have a permit. Um, these things, all, any cultural resources are protected, and it's a felony offense to dig on federal lands. And then, of course, human remains are greatly protected as they never were in the past. Um, people would be able to go out, in fact, the earliest origins of physical anthropology were going out and pilfering Native American graves for collections, for analysis, for measuring. Well, we no longer do that, especially in Florida. We have very strict laws. Chapter 872 deals with human remains. You cannot knowingly disturb any grave, whether it's a new grave or an ancient grave. Second misdemeanor, if you don't even report it, if you know of someone in, impacting a burial and don't report it. And chapter 267 is what regulates where you can dig and what type of permission. Um, and it also, something interesting to note is, if you are caught digging on state or federal land or even private land where you don't have the owner's permission and you get caught, not only will you get arrested, but every piece of equipment you were using on that site will also be taken by the state, including your truck and all of your gear. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, now we have incredible archaeological resources throughout the state. The Florida Anthropological Society, as I said, has chapters throughout the state that bring together both novices and professionals. So um, if you, you know, we guide people over to the FAS chapters whenever they call us wanting to get together and, and uh, 
be part of an excavation, get field experience. Uh, they continue to publish the Florida Anthropologist. The Florida Archaeological Council was formed as kind of a, a professional organization of, uh, that represents archaeologists throughout the state. And they have a great hand in, in uh, guiding legislation to protect sites and to regulate uh, development. And of course, now our university systems. We have university systems in anthropology and archaeology throughout the state. Of course, Florida State University, and then you have all those others that kind of come along. But you can attend almost every state institution in the state of Florida now and get training and education in archaeology and anthropology. And what we see about all of this coming together is reflected in the last section of the book. Um, there are two, actually two articles by Gerald Milanich, who is one of the most prolific writers in Florida archaeology. He has numerous books on Florida natives, on mission uh, period sites, on contact sites. Um, and his frolicking bears, wet vultures, and other mysteries is just this romp through history uh, through a man's articles named Cummings, who was a journalist in the 1800s who documented people coming to Florida to pilfer all of the wildlife and to dig in the Indian mounds. So Milanich does a wonderful job of bringing this old, all of these old historic documents to light. In Mythic Landscapes of the Boom and Bust Whedon Island, Florida, um, Stewart does a wonderful job of retracing the history of this incredible site. And this is the same site that, that Sterling and Fuchs excavated and brought the public into. But this site itself has gone through such incredible turmoil, not only from its archaeological past, but everything that's happened since then. So she gives this wonderful overview of all of the different characterizations this site and this island has taken. And finally, as the perfect capstone to the book is Kathy Deegan's uh, final article on the historical archaeology of 16th century La Florida. Kathy Deegan is uh, probably the top historic archaeologist in the state of Florida. She's done pr her primary research on St. Augustine, and she's been in the field a very long time doing incredibly meticulous work. She not only finishes the book with this uh, wonderful synthesis on all the work that's been done on contact period sites, but she also wrote the introduction to the book. So she brings all of this into context, the evolution of archaeology in the state and this close intermarriage between history and archaeology. So, um, you know, you read her introduction, you end the book with this incredible synthesis, and it just kind of puts the whole thing in perspective. So I hope you will hang out. If uh, we have some time for questions, I'll be happy to sign a book. And I hope you enjoy reading it as much as I did, because as I said, when I first started, I thought, well, these are history articles. You know, how much will they have... Um, kind of to bear on what I've done and the areas of interest I've been. And it was an incredible education for me, and I hope it's an incredible education for you. And I think it's a really engaging way to learn about history through these really fascinating articles. So thank you very much. Um, I can answer some questions if we have any. And like I said, please stick around and hang out at the party for a while. Yes, Elaine. Mm -hmm. That's not you or uh, well, maybe you. But, you know, people, individuals cannot get a permit to right. go and look for artifacts on state or federal land. Exactly. You have to be guided by a professional archaeologist, but that's where that catch kind of comes in, because not only can, you know, Joe Schmo go up and grab one, that's what instills that any type of exploration or, in, or whether it's phase one surveys or actual excavations are undertaken under the supervision of an archaeologist. So that's the, the job of DHR to regulate that. You can buy a permit to collect fossils. Right. Mm -hmm. pick up uh, anything older than 50 years right. state or federal 
And the DHR website has all of these laws laid out. They're a wonderful reference, so you know all you have to do is Google it. They'll take you right to it. It has all of not only the laws and regulations, but also everything they do. They have an incredible underwater program uh, that Roger Smith, who's going to be attending, he's going to be the keynote speaker at our annual meeting. He's the state underwater archaeologist. So they're there for us, for all of us. So if you have questions or issues, uh, you can contact them directly you can contact me and I'll put you in touch with the appropriate people any other questions no well thank you very much and please stick around and I'll I think uh, Ben has a couple of announcements and Rachel will be happy to answer more questions and uh, she'll be sitting right over here to sign copies of her book uh, please purchase the book here at the cash register first Chris will be happy to uh, bring up a, a copy of your book and then take it over. Rachel, Rachel will be happy to uh, sign it for you. Please stick around. There's plenty of goodies and, and coffee and wine and all sorts of stuff back there. And uh, thank you for being here. Thank you very much. <laughs>